Hey guys, I'm your host, Tara A. Devlin, and welcome to this week's episode of Koobana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. My latest book, Mei Taisho, Bizarre Incidents from Japan's Past, is now out. If hearing about some of the weird, bizarre, strange, and downright frightening events from the last 100 or so years of Japanese history interests you, then do head over and check it out right now. We also have a brand new design up in the Koobana merchandise store. You can check that out at koobana.store. We have shirts, mugs, stickers, masks, and much more, so do check it out and help support the show at the same time. This week, we have a few short stories of terrifying things that shouldn't be. And finally, the ending of the My Friend in the Tape series. How will it all come together? Stay tuned to the end to find out. But first, a teacher at an all-girls high school soon notices something odd. There appears to be a mysterious extra student in one of the classes that nobody is aware of. What's really going on? Find out in... The 33rd Student I just recently heard this story from a childhood friend I've known for about 20 years now. This friend, let's call him A, worked as an English teacher at an all-girls high school. He always used the photocopier at school to print sheets for class, but there were four classes to a single grade, so he had to print quite a few to make sure everyone got one. Now, if he printed handouts for all four classes at once, that would take not just a lot of time, but present a variety of other problems as well. So, he did them class by class when necessary, printing them only before that specific class. However, there was one class in particular where there was always a different number of sheets to what he specified to print. There were 32 students in this class, so he told the copier to print 32 sheets. But when they were done, there were always 33. At first, he thought it was just a simple mistake, so he didn't think much of it, but it happened every single time, and only for this particular class. It never happened for any others. A would hand the sheets to the students in the first row of desks and ask them to hand them out to the rest of the students sitting behind them. And every single time, there was always one left over. Sir, why is there always one extra? The students would ask him. Ah, uh, that's for me, he'd say, knowing very well that wasn't the reason why. He already had a copy for himself in his own folder. Finding this occurrence strange, A started to wonder if he was losing his mind. He decided to count the number of prints right there at the copy machine. He put 31 into the machine, so he should end up with 32 at the end. The 31 copies and the original sheet. 1. 2. The sheets slowly came out. Keeping his eyes firmly glued on them, he counted each sheet as it emerged. As the 31st sheet came out, the machine stopped. He took the original out and then counted them again. No doubt about it, 32 sheets. But when he took them to class and handed them out, still there was one sheet left over. A chill ran down his spine. Panicking, he counted the number of students again, but there was nobody missing. And there were 32 in the room. There was no way an extra sheet could be left. And yet, there was. A was flabbergasted and turned to the students. There are 32 students in this class, correct? They all laughed at him. Sir, are you still half asleep? but he couldn't let the matter go. There aren't 33 students here, right? He asked the question with a serious look on his face, but the students asked him to quit playing around and couldn't stop laughing. This couldn't continue, so he tried to compose himself. Don't worry about it. I'm just imagining things, he said, trying to calm the class down. But as he did, he heard an angry voice coming from somewhere in the room. 
How did you know? How did you know? How did you know? He was so frightened that everything seemed to go black. And next thing he knew, he was lying on a sofa in the principal's office. And, well, let's just say he no longer works at that school. He's not even a teacher anymore. He quit soon thereafter and returned to his hometown. These days, he just hangs around at his parents' house, which happens to be just two doors down from my own. I had trouble asking him why he quit his job when he returned, but I decided to finally ask him when we went out drinking recently, and that was what he told me. But the scariest part of all, he said, was that when he was leaving the school, he found a student from that class he was trying his best to avoid and, once again, asked them about it. It turned out, the person screaming, how did you know, was A himself. I definitely heard the voice, but I have no memory of saying that myself, he said. Maybe he really was losing his mind. I'm not going to lie, I'm a little worried about him. Next, a university student visits his parents' new house and decides to explore the area. While climbing a nearby mountain, he encounters a rather odd lady who makes him question whether she is actually even real or not. Find out why in Where Are You From? This is something frightening that happened to me when I returned home recently. I don't mind if you think it's fake, but let me tell you what happened. I'm a student in Tokyo at the moment, but just yesterday I returned from a visit home to the countryside of Okayama. I went back to see my parents for the first time in a year. They moved to a new house shortly after I left for university, so I wasn't that familiar with the area. At any rate, this was only my second time visiting them in their new place. Before, they lived in Kurashiki, but their new house is now in Okayama City. Now. I say city, but they still live way out in the middle of nowhere. You'll understand what I mean if you also live on the outskirts, but once you leave the area surrounding the station, most of Okayama is just countryside. Their new house was about 40 minutes from the station by car, so it was kind of a hybrid area with lots of farms and rice fields, but also a decent amount of residential housing too. Anyway. I returned home, but there wasn't exactly a lot to do, so I was bored. After thinking it over, I realised I didn't know the surrounding areas that well, so I decided to get on my bike and do a little exploring. I rode alongside a river for a while, noting the location of various convenience stores, when I found the entrance to a small mountain or hill or something. I mean... What else was I supposed to do? Of course I had to climb the thing. I was bored after all. I left my bike at the entrance and started climbing. It wasn't really tall enough to call it a mountain, but I reached the top in about 30 minutes. There was a small park at the top, and I quickly realised what a fool I was. That's right, the sun was quickly setting. Now, in Tokyo, there are lights everywhere, so even at night, everything is still bright. But I wasn't in Tokyo anymore. I was in Okayama. Not only that, I was on top of a small mountain. The sun was quickly setting, so I figured I'd better rush back down. It took about 30 minutes to climb up, so I guessed it would take maybe 20 minutes to go back down. But as I was about to return, I suddenly heard a voice. It was a woman. I was like, what the hell? Where are you from? She asked. She didn't even say hello or anything, so I was more than just a little confused. But she was grinning ear to ear. Ah, uh, Tokyo, I said. It wasn't technically a lie. Look, the sun's about to set, so I think we should quickly head back down, I continued but the woman just continued smiling at me. What's her problem? I thought, 
but I didn't really want to involve myself any further. That smile on her face was looking more and more creepy. Her eyes weren't smiling, and it looked incredibly fake. It's hard to explain, but it just didn't feel right. Alright, well, I'm heading back down now, I said, and quickly picked up the pace. I thought she might follow me, but when I turned around, nobody was there. I was actually relieved. By the time I reached my bike, it was already pretty dark. I wondered if that woman would be okay, but when I remembered her smile, I got chills and decided to go straight back home. What's your name? A voice suddenly asked from behind me. I quickly turned around and it was that woman. She was still smiling and looking at me. Immediately, I started to panic. I mean, something was clearly messed up here. I looked back several times on the way down and didn't see anybody, so how did she follow me so quickly? And why was she asking for my name? I said nothing, and so she asked me again. s saito I quickly said. Of course, it wasn't my real name. I was reading a wiki entry on Saito Hajime from the Shinsengumi before I left, so that was the first thing that came to mind. The woman said nothing, but just kept smiling at me. Well, I have to go now, I said, getting on my bike and pedaling as fast as I could. Seriously, I pedaled as fast as I could without looking back. When I reached a convenience store on the road home, I quickly dropped by to pretend to read some magazines on the stand while I tried to calm down. After that, I was able to safely return home. I told my mother what happened when I got back, but she didn't believe me. You don't have a girlfriend, so you must have been seeing things, she said with a laugh. Why on earth would I want a girlfriend forcing a fake smile like that, I replied. But I was starting to feel a little less afraid. Maybe she was just a local who took a shortcut down the mountain that I didn't know of. I stayed at my parents' house for about a week after that, and then I returned to Tokyo. Nothing else weird happened during my stay, but then yesterday. I was returning home on the bullet train, and as I went to get on another train at Tokyo Station, I got the shock of my life. That woman was standing on the opposite platform. Even her clothes were exactly the same as that day on the mountain. The only difference was that this time, she wasn't smiling. There was no expression on her face. She then seemed to notice me looking at her in surprise, and when she saw me, the corners of her lips started to upturn. Honestly, I nearly cried. She seemed to be saying something to me, but her voice was too quiet to make anything out. The woman started running for the platform stairs just as the train arrived. I quickly jumped on and internally screamed for it to leave already. In the end, the train left and I had no idea where that woman went. Then, last night, I arrived home. I'm praying that I won't run into that woman again. I'm sorry the ending wasn't that strong, but this really happened to me, so not much I can do about that. I don't have any ability to see the other side either nor have I ever once seen a ghost. And now, the final part of the My Friend in the Tape series. How does it all come together? What has been going on all this time? Where do they go from here? Find out in My Friend in the Tape 6. This is B. And this is the postscript to the My Friend in the Tape series. Well, I guess it's more of an after that than an actual postscript. One year and nine months have passed since T started writing. I read what he left behind numerous times. I've known him for many years and reading what he wrote, I think I finally understand the source of T's abnormalities after M came into the picture. About T. This is what I heard from his mother. 
After the Obon holidays, he was apparently okay, but not in the best health. He visited the hospital for some tests, but they were unable to find anything wrong with him, so he went back to work as usual. But one day in October, he didn't show up to work and there was no notice that he would be away, so his supervisor went to visit his house during his lunch break. He found T collapsed in the doorway, wearing his work suit, so he was quickly rushed to a hospital close to his workplace. He was wearing a different coloured shirt to the previous day, so it was likely he passed out that morning. They conducted various tests, but they were unable to find out what was wrong with him as he continued to lie in a coma. He was then transferred to a local hospital. T was put on leave from work, but it wasn't until a year later that he finally woke up. He'd been in a coma for so long that his father decided to end his job in the meantime. C and M went to visit him almost every day while he was in the hospital. M's mother also went to see him numerous times as well. But perhaps what was most confusing for him was waking up with almost no memories and having people like M, C and some young nurses and the like tell him that they were his girlfriend and they were engaged to be married. He was terribly confused and while his mother said she appreciated the fact that they all liked her son, lying to him wasn't a good idea. I heard all this when we went to the hospital to cover his bills. Apparently he had tens of millions of yen in stocks and savings, as well as other insurance policies with his mother as a beneficiary, so he had more than enough to cover things by himself. The following information now comes from me personally. I also went to visit T in the hospital and I saw C and M wiping him down as he slept. I was so jealous. M worked at her parents' pharmacy so she could easily visit him during the day, but C quit being a model and was working for a design company so she could only visit him in the evenings. Even after he woke up, T needed a lot of rehabilitation, even for simple things such as eating. Things seemed even harder than when he was in a coma, but whenever I went to see him, either M, C or his mother was always there with him. As everyone showed him photos and talked to him of the past, gradually his memory started to return, and now he's staying at his parents' place again. Once he got back home, while his memory wasn't perfect, he was still able to destroy everyone academically. At the moment, it appears most of his memories have returned, and he was offered a job in the development wing of a large company, starting April 2015. According to various acquaintances, T is so good at what he does that he's rather famous in the industry. It's kind of hard to believe that he makes the most money when he has such a large, empty spot in his career history. Now that he's back with his parents, us childhood friends hang out a lot more again, and he's someone rather important to all of us. And when I went to visit him in the hospital, I was successful in asking M out. This is what happened when the two of us were finally alone together. I told her that T had a favourite coffee shop, so I invited her there. The owner does everything from blending the beans to roasting them. T was good friends with the owner and so he had him make two types of coffee for him, one hot and one cold, roasted to his liking. When I said I was T's friend, the owner showed us to a private room with a sofa by the window that T often used. M ordered the hot coffee T always got, while I got a regular iced coffee. We spoke with the incredibly fast laptop that T always used open in front of us. It was the laptop he left behind in A's car after the camp. I called him to let him know that he forgot it, but he said to keep it for the time being. Feel free to use it until I get it back. It's stupidly fast, so it's good to pass the time. It'll burn your legs though, he said. At a glance it looked like a Fujitsu, 
but inside was an NSD, an i7EX, a motherboard I'd never heard of, 16 gigabytes of memory on the OS, and a battery with cell density double the normal one. Using the internet, I told M some of the history of T's family. His family history could be easily traced even on the internet with just his surname and family crest. If I write too much, then he'll be easily identifiable. So let's just say about a thousand years ago, they went from an imperial family to commoners. M said that T's mother also had a rather powerful guardian spirit. So when I looked up her maiden name, which T had previously told me, it turned out she was from a former imperial family as well. When we were students and I was in the car with T one day, he said he wanted to drop something off because we were near his mother's family home. We stopped at the gate, but it was a massive place. And I remember there was a row of storehouses behind the main house. They've got storehouses, huh? I said. And he said it was because the family used to be merchants in the past. His mother was always kind and thoughtful, but I suddenly understood why she seemed to be rather high class as well. All of that was no doubt why T had famous warriors and Kamisama watching over him. Next, I opened a hidden folder, put T's name in as the password, and showed M the first three parts of my friend in the tape. She seemed to understand T's situation and then started talking. Apparently, if we included the information from T's grandmother, the thing that killed E and put T's guardians in such a bad state was probably something that existed before Japanese people started to worship Kami. Because it was not created by man, it had a strong power to return to nothingness, but it seemed it was destroyed by being overwhelmed by great numbers. But in doing so, T's guardians may have used too much power. It seemed that T really was getting revenge for E. In the part where he spoke about being asleep at M's house, when he said he felt something strange on his face, I asked M about it, and she confessed with a red face that she was kissing him. I couldn't bring myself to ask if that was all she did. As for my guardian spirit, apparently it's an alcoholic peasant. There was no difference whether it was there or not, so apparently it wouldn't be able to protect me very well. A's guardian was a hamster. When I asked her to describe it, it sounded just like the hamster he had when we were in kindergarten. Not even T knew about that, so there was no way for M to know about it. Hearing that, I decided to believe her story about the guardian spirits. About T and C. T was always worried because I said that I liked C, but I said that back in elementary school. For some reason, T remembered it as being in junior high. It was no lie that C was always bright, fun, kind, and cute. But while everyone thought that way, it was like, there was never a chance for any of us. It was impossible for her to end up with anyone but T, you know? I guess everyone else felt the same way as well, because T was always like, people keep coming up to me to ask for my permission before confessing to C. What's that all about? And especially during that live performance he wrote about, even I, as a dude, found it so dramatic that I was kind of tearing up. As T sang, a cappella, without a microphone, and he was really good, and approached C, her expression of fear softened, and when he kissed her hand, the audience could clearly see the change on her face to one of confidence. By the end of the song, almost all the women in the audience were crying. Seeing that made me realize once again that I would never be able to compete with T. There was no way to get between them. Back in junior high, there was a time where C and some other girls were peeling mandarins and edamame for him. At first I thought he was making them do it, but 
the girls took it upon themselves when he said, Oh, these are tasty, but peeling the skin is such a hassle, so it's fine. I don't need any. T was seemingly oblivious to what would normally be taken as a sign of affection by anyone else, and he passed it off as women just being kind. And so, despite how close they were, unfortunately, T really did only think of C as nothing more than a close friend. T and C's families have secretly been arranging their marriage before T's memories fully return. The invites have already arrived. When I told C that I got my invite, she screamed, I did it! So, it was her behind it all. When I asked her about it, she said she recorded the conversation they had in the tent on her phone. I'll marry you once you turn 35, if no one else has. However, she cut parts out and kept only the I'll marry you part and played it for his parents. But neither C nor T are 35 yet. That's very different to the promise they made. When I told her that, she said excitedly, It makes no difference if we wait. The result will be the same. It's fate. She felt that he was missing out on one of life's biggest milestones. Marriage. Women truly are scary. T apparently only heard once the invites were done and was completely fooled. I don't remember it, but apparently I made a promise before I passed out, so I'll follow through with it. I can't embarrass C like that, he said before going to buy an engagement ring for her. I tagged along as chauffeur the weekend I got the invite. He bought a ring worth 4 million yen retail for 3 million yen, with the idea that it could be sold for living expenses should anything ever happen. What a conscientious guy. He specified all the details for it, including the weight, colour, transparency and such for the 10 diamonds to be cut for it. It was the first time I realised that the price of the ring and the stones are different, and I was surprised to learn that the shape and height could be changed to match the stones as well. When we returned from the store, I saw him going over all sorts of situations in his head over how to propose, as this would be a moment C would remember for the rest of her life. Once again, it hit me how great of a guy he was, but it also looked like he was trying to convince himself at the same time that he really did like C too. It was strange that he proposed after the wedding invites had already been sent out, but C and T went together to choose their wedding rings, getting platinum rings that were comfortable for them both from a top-class maker. When I asked why they were blue diamonds embedded in the side of the ring, the soon-to-be bride said it was something blue, meant to bring good luck for the bride. C's ring had some small diamonds on the outside and some pink diamonds in the middle. It was very cute. Apparently the original design had a clear diamond, but T bought a deep pink one that came with a certificate saying, fancy vivid purplish pink, and exchanged it for that. After the size of the ring was decided, T went to the store alone and asked them to exchange the clear diamond for a pink one, as a surprise for C. He ordered it when he bought C's engagement ring because it was so pretty. He thought it suited C, and he liked the meaning behind it. I didn't even know precious stones had a meaning to them. T said it wasn't a big deal, but when I asked him more about pink diamonds, he said that they were the most beautiful part, cut from larger stones, and I was shocked to hear that one single stone was more expensive than my entire bonus. When I asked him if they had slept together yet, he shook his head. Eh? With C? I've never even thought about it. There's no way. There's no denying that she's a great girl, but I don't think I ever could. But I guess I liked her enough to agree to marriage. But there's something different. We're more like brother and sister. Guess I'll have to deal with that, huh? 
After everything he went through, all he could say was, I guess I liked her. Well, there you go. When I asked him why he spent more than my annual bonus on a ring for someone he didn't even want to sleep with, he said, Normally I'd split the price, but I figured I could at least make her happy with a present. Her smile brightens up the place, and that makes me happy. You gotta spend money to make money. There's no point in saving it at the end of the day. It's just paper. It can be a problem if you have too much, but not so much if you have too little. As long as I have enough to live, I'm perfectly happy. Apparently, it wasn't something he was buying in response to C's feelings, but rather simply something to make his friend happy. He chose it so it would overall enhance her image, but not outshine her. Yet his comment about money didn't convince me, so I pressed him on it. According to T, as long as we took care of our relationships with others, then things would work out, even if you didn't have money. If your stomach is full, then your heart will never be poor. But if you have too much money, that'll attract bad people, and thus fake friendships, making the risk of losing what's important to you all that much higher. He didn't want to take any risks if it meant losing us, his childhood friends. Not enough is just enough, he said with a laugh. C said that T was inspired by Kuroyanagi Tetsuko and sent 1% of his income and dividends to help feed people in poor countries. Even when he looked at a photo of E, he had no memories of him. Who is that? I don't know him, but he feels like someone important, he said. Even when speaking of past stories, he would say stuff like, There was someone other than A, B, C, D, and F, right? Someone very important. Seeing him suffer like that, I couldn't hold back the tears and excused myself to the bathroom. About M. She often talks about T, and ever since he returned to his parents' house, she's often seen there too. T never locks the door when he's there, so she enters without permission. He said that he doesn't want to lock his friends out. And T's cat, who is very cautious with strangers, entirely ignores her, which shows just how much she's been there. She always watches over him lovingly as he sleeps. He still sleeps a lot. When he's awake, he's mostly doing rehabilitation or study. When I asked her why she visits him so much when he spends two-thirds of the day sleeping, apparently he would pat her head when he wakes up and say, M-chan, good morning. He would refuse if she tried it the other way, though. C told me that if you put a hand on his arm or chest or anywhere really, then his expression would soften as he slept. It didn't matter who it was. Even I was okay. M told me she had liked T ever since they first laid eyes each other in April of the third grade of junior high. However, she grew worried about his guardian spirits after trying to talk to him one day, so she regretted avoiding him after that. Apparently, she tailed T for roughly a full year like a stalker. She saw the bullied kid that T helped gain more and more confidence, and so she wanted to help as well. About T and E. In the first part, T referred to E as something like a perfect manga character. I thought the same too. T always looked up to E, and A, the one who brought him into our group of friends, was like his real older brother. But E, well, he always thought of T as somewhat of an outsider, a cheat, and said there was nobody else on the planet as interesting as him. He was also a little intimidated by T's abilities, and so, in order to maintain his dignity as someone older, he tried even harder when he was around. He genuinely felt pleased whenever he was able to do something that gained T's recognition. 
about D and F. They got back together after that camp and in April this year, 2014, they got married. For financial reasons, everything for their ceremony was made by us. They're not planning on having a baby, so I'm praying that D's job will last a long time. When I told them that T said F was a little scary because of how she always acted like a big sister, she said it was because she was always worried, because he lived his life like he was in a constant rush. About A. He's still a temp worker. A year before the Lehman shock, T apparently told him, the economy is about to go to shit, so you should try to find stable, long-term employment now. But at the time, he was just like, what the hell is he on about? But T did his best to convince him. Rather than finding a company that fits you, first, you need to make yourself fit the company. Then, once you understand the job, little by little, you can change things to suit you better. If anyone can do it, it's you. Now, he apparently regrets not doing what T said. He's a real-life example of not crying over spilt milk. About B. Me. T wrote that I was strong, but I've been destroyed by him before. I think most people have done something like this when they were younger, but I played a prank on C, who I found really cute, in the third grade of junior high, and this made her cry. When T heard her screams, he snapped and rushed at me, so I prepared myself, but the first hit knocked me flying. I held my arm up to protect myself, but he hit it so hard that it broke. If I didn't have it up, he probably would have broken my ribs. T only gets angry when it comes to others, so that was the first time I'd ever seen him like that, and even remembering it now is so terrifying that it gives me goosebumps. Anyway, I continued to protect my face from his fists, but I soon passed out. I probably had a concussion. I had swelling and cracks in both arms. I practiced Shodinji Kempo and karate, but I'd never experienced anything like that even in a match or training against a master. I was good enough to compete in national tournaments, but that made me realize there were still people much, much better than me out there who I could never beat. Anyway, putting all that aside, I'm currently dating a nurse from the hospital T is in. Just having him around really does help with the ladies. But even though I have a girlfriend, I'm still interested in M as well. Ew, that's gross. Stop playing those. She once said about me playing adult-oriented games, so now I just do so behind her back. And now, a postscript. I went to T and C's wedding. It was Japanese styled, with T wearing some old clothes with his family crest that had been passed down through the generations. He seemed quite used to it, putting it on with little difficulty after his shower and then naturally greeting guests immediately after. I told him that if his face was a little bigger, then it would suit him much better. C said that T's mother made her a white kimono, a colourful wedding kimono, a formal dress, and formal seasonal wear as well. I can't even put these on by myself, she said happily, and apparently T told her that she would have to learn flower arrangement, tea ceremony, and Japanese dancing next. That way, she could learn how to dress in them and how to behave as well. All the women in his family wore formal Japanese wear that they knew how to put on themselves without help. I was convinced the colour and design were made to make C stand out as the most beautiful person at the venue. She was so beautiful, I fell in love with her all over again. Seeing her in that white kimono made my heart jump, T said with a laugh. Seeing everyone else fawn over her honestly made me jealous. Finally, I have a daughter, T's mother said, overjoyed. 
She's so beautiful. We decided back when she was in elementary school that C would marry T, C's parents said, so happy they were in tears. Finally, that day has come. I almost fell for T myself as he led the trembling C to the altar in front of the gods in such a gentlemanly manner. I'm going to have to review the video so I can learn how to stand and behave too. The reception was held in an old traditional Japanese restaurant, but after the groom's address, T was back to his usual smiling self. It was a fantastic reception. T got his bike license at 16, so he never drank at events like this, saying he would regret it too much if he ever had an accident and was unable to move again. But on this day, he drank to his heart's content. Everyone kept pouring drinks for him, which he downed right away. Are you okay? I asked him, but he seemed to very much be enjoying himself. These are celebratory drinks, so as long as everyone is smiling and happy, I'm perfectly fine, he said. C struggled with the formal clothes she wasn't used to, and her wig was so heavy that she couldn't look down to get any food or drink. She was able to rehydrate, however, with the special fruits and such they had prepared for her. T blushed when he looked at her face for a moment, and then picked from amongst the fruit. Each time he fed it to her, he was apparently right on the mark as to which one she wanted, because she said, Bingo! I wondered whether he really did pick the correct one each time, and C said that he'd always been able to choose correctly, even without her saying anything. T said he could do the same even when they were far apart. I couldn't help but believe that the red string of fate really was real. M, who had been looking after T for so long, was also invited to the wedding. She seemed almost drunk with happiness. Si Chan, you're so beautiful. Ti Kun, you look so handsome. I wonder what approach she'll take towards them in the future. For their honeymoon, they plan to go to Hawaii with their parents, then go to Germany alone and rent a car, before travelling to Turkey, Greece, Italy and Spain. They plan to only stay in hotels they really wanted to, and other than that, whatever happens, happens. They even plan to sleep in the car, if needs be. That was probably because of tea. It sounded like it would be a tough trip, but probably fun too. When they got back from their trip, they brought me a souvenir. I was impressed by the power of jewellery. Seeing C with her wedding ring made everything seem more real, and she seemed to shine more brightly than ever. I asked her to take her ring off to see whether it was her or the ring that was truly shining, but her presence felt totally different once she took the ring off. That pink diamond really does make the owner shine more brightly. T said that the pink diamond wasn't something designed to show off someone's power, but rather a mere tool to maximise the attractiveness of the person wearing it. The light, apparently determined by the cut and claws. The size and ring colour all had to match the bearer of the ring, otherwise it wouldn't work and the person would look wrong. These days, store clerks had more business sense than any other sense, like they couldn't see the forest for the trees. So when women spoke to staff, they would fall into a habit of simply picking the cutest ring rather than the one that fit them personally. Nice, isn't it? C said with a smile. I put a spell on it to make C a better woman, T said, and she turned red in an instant. They seemed to be getting more and more friendly, or perhaps things were heating up, because while T was his usual self, C was touching him more and more and acting like a wife around him. Well, she had finally gotten her first love after 20 years of waiting, so yeah, no doubt she was happy. 
As I looked at photos from their trip and they told me various stories, T said something that caught my attention. For some reason, my coins are eroding really fast. And maybe I'm just tired from the trip, but every now and then, I can see a red mist on the edge of my vision. Maybe it's because of the pressure on the plane, C suggested. At any rate, you should visit the doctor and get some tests done. But the moment I heard red mist, it suddenly hit me. If you've been reading this series, you no doubt would have noticed as well. That's the exact same thing E saw. Apparently, T doesn't hear any voices, but I don't want to lose any more close friends. E on the SD card is silent now. I'll ask C about the shrine near T's birth home and try to visit it as much as I can. I think I'll talk to M about it as well. Now, I have to decide whether to show C the video or not. I think T wanted to hide it from her, but now that she's directly involved, I think she has a right to see it. But I also want to respect T's wishes before he collapses. But I also want to speak to A, D, and F about it too. I don't know what the best course of action is right now. All I can do is pray. I think if T passes away, C will be destroyed. If gods really do exist, I hope they would not turn their backs on C, who gave up everything just to finally get what she wanted. All of this happened just a few days ago. I don't know what's going to happen to T, but for now, this is the end. In his stead, I'd like to thank everyone for reading. A huge thank you and shout out to this week's Kami Tier members, Christina and S Dash. It's thanks to your support, along with everyone else, that I'm able to keep doing this show, so thank you very much. Don't forget to check out Mei Tai Sho, Bizarre Incidents from Japan's Past, out on Amazon right now. And check out our newly revamped merchandise store at koabana.store. And if you'd like to chat about this week's stories, come and join us in the Koabana Discord. You can find that link in the description or on koabana.net. You can also check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash Tara A. Devlin for exclusive bonus stories and extras. Or our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash koabanajapan for all sorts of Japanese horror you won't find anywhere else. Thanks guys, stay safe, and I'll see you again next time for even more Koobana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. Want even more scary stories? Head over to koobana.net for new translations every week. You can also join our Patreon for exclusive stories you won't find anywhere else. Head over to koabana.net now.